Hi, welcome to SOAS. You've joined us at an exciting time in, in the development of the School of Law. You would have walked past the building site outside where Senate House, where, where the School of Law will be housed in 2015. The faculty is growing. We've added all more than a quarter to the, of numbers to the academic staff in the last 18 months. And with them has come the excitement and dynamism you always get from, from new blood coming into a department. This is the fourth conference we've had this week. Um, and it's part of our new policy of going out there and putting things on and you know, telling people about what the School of Law is doing. Um, and when Nima came to me with the idea for today's conference, I, I was absolutely delighted because there's no greater moment for radical scholarship to be celebrated. We live in a world where we're told about the value for money, we're told about the value of research, we're told about the value of employability, we're told about value added. Well, maybe, but we're tripping silently into a Wildian nightmare where we know the price of everything, or at least vice chancellors know the price of everything and the value of absolutely nothing. And therefore, and law is particularly vulnerable. We're seen as a vocational subject. We're seen as something which is owned by the professions, where the professions tell us what they want. The latest incarnation of that is, of course, the Legal Education and Training Review, the move from knowledge-based to outcome-based requirements. And that might be wonderful. That might be good. That might be an opportunity. But I took from it this quote because I think it's chilling and I think it sums up what today is not about. It says in that report that an outcome-based qualifying law degree would be more effective at delivering interns who are training ready. I had to write that down because I kept remembering the quote as compliant, but I think that sums it up. That's exactly what Duncan Kennedy is not about. It's exactly why we entered the legal, legal academe, is not to produce compliant creatures of the professions. Now, at this point, I'm meant to give you a quick biog, usually cloyingly laudatory, long on detail, short on interest. I'm not going to embarrass Duncan with that or bore you with it. You're here, that says everything about how much we value his scholarship and, what, and how much we value the fact he came to us today. And at that point, I'd like to simply welcome Duncan Kennedy. One or two things. We've got an hour and a half for this session. Um, Duncan's going to kick off. 30 minutes. For 30 minutes or so. Costas will, will respond for... For an hour. <laughs> <laughs> 25 minutes or so. <laughs> um, and then we'll have a, an open conversation, um, even if I have to push Costas off the, the podium. Um, I don't think either Duncan or Costas really need much of an introduction. Um, I'm, I was a bit curious when I was asked to moderate this because I was thinking, what kind of conversation am I going to be moderating? Is this going to be a, a no-holds-barred battle between the two major figures on each side of the Atlantic of the critical leftist legal traditions? And of course they are quite distinct traditions in many ways, so there is perhaps opening for a, an interesting conversation between the American style of critical legal studies with its roots in 19th century pragmatism and early 20th century legal realism and the continental style critical legal studies with its roots in Kant, Hegel and more recent continental philosophy. So I was thinking there might be an interesting conversation there between the two traditions. But actually, on reflection, I started thinking, well, actually, they're far too erudite, the two of them, um, they know each other for far too long for that necessarily to be the beginning and the end of the conversation. So I, I think actually what we'll end up with is quite a engaging, opening, uh, hopefully a, a longer, more enduring conversation about the topic of Duncan's talk, which is the relationship between left politics and left legal theory. So that's all I think I wanted to open out with. I think if we don't have an argument, we'll... I've obviously had to try and provoke one, but um, I'll s make you start off, Duncan. Okay. Is 
So it's, it, let me see, if, can you hear me if I speak at this level? Can you hear me in the back? Uh, it's an incredible pleasure to be here, and I, I'm a little shocked at how happy it makes me. I think something may be off. So the past, the past and future of the left, I'm here to represent the past unequivocally, and that's what I'm going to do. I am going to actually represent the past, uh, present a version of the past of American critical legal studies in the way that I did it. So it's not about American critical legal studies generically any more than Costas can speak for British critical legal studies. We're both in the position of eccentrics, um, even within the tendency that we have helped to build and organize, which but is in a, the dominant tendency. I would say, <laughs> I would say or if not the dominant tendency, in my case, the surviving tendency <laughs> is about all we could say about it. Uh, because there are very few people left in American legal academia who would ever describe themselves as crits. Can you hear me now as I move away from the microphone? Is it still audible? You can't hear me. Some say yes, some say no. Uh, I'd much rather speak without the microphone like this if you can't hear me. No, OK, it won't. Sorry, posterity requires me to speak from the microphone. So what I'm going to do is give a description. Um, as I said, nobody in the US today Practically, very few people would describe themselves as crits. There are many people who were once crits. What did you do in the 30s would be the kind of, in the generation before mine that people asked. And it turned out lots and lots of people were communists or anarchists. But by the 1950s, they were very, very few on the ground. And a large number of them were CIA or FBI agents, as a matter of fact. So the situation of critical legal studies is that in the United States, it's gone. But it actually has a fairly powerful, fairly real uh, continuing background presence. There are many, many people who have absorbed tons of stuff from it. And it's, in a sense, a part of a common interdisciplinary mishmash of things that can be combined more or less randomly while you write your piece for tenure. So it's still there. It is, it's a little degraded. As a, form, as a form, it's a little degraded to be reduced to one of the tendencies of interdisciplinarity. Uh, but that's all I'm going to say for the moment about critical legal studies. I want to start by saying something about my topic. So I am going to try to talk about left practice in relation to left theory. And I'm going to try to do it in a somewhat odd way. So I'm going to begin by talking about some of my experiences of left practice and the ways in which they put pressure on the kinds of left theory that seem plausible to me. So I'm going to do this from the ground up, typically American boring American stuff, always has to start from the case and so forth, and I'm going to do that. So let me begin by two practices. So I want to emphasize that what I'm going to be describing is modest, not very successful, earnestly pursued, good left projects. And it, I have no sense that I myself was a leader in the projects I'm about to describe. I'll say something about critical legal studies later, but these are aspects of daily life that have been incredibly important to me during my legal past, uh, past of the legal left. So the first is landlord-tenant work. So for many years, starting in the late 70s, I participated in various uh, projects based in Harvard University in its clinical program, but allied with the nationally funded legal services organization for poor people in trying to figure out how a clinic that served low-income tenants could do more than just defend them from eviction. The question was whether a clinic that had, say, 15 students and th four paralegals and four lawyers and therefore had a significant caseload in a low-income neighborhood where many, for example, single women on welfare lived with their three children in a two-bedroom flat where the, there were rats and there was a persistent sewage smell because the plumbing never really was fully modernized after the tenement was built in 1895, could, something could be done about those conditions. And the idea was, very straightforwardly, to try to do targeted litigation. 
So this is something that's been tried in a million places by a million people in different ways. I just happened to participate in a particular Boston, Massachusetts version of this kind of experiment, where the idea was could we signal, single out the worst landlords and try to crash them by inundating them with defenses when they tried to evict people and then countersuing them. That very quickly raised the question of how to understand the economics of the neighborhood. And there, when we started, the neighborhood was in decline. And this strategy had very limited usefulness because it provoked abandonment. Then the neighborhood started to gentrify, and the strategy suddenly became extremely plausible because the landlords wanted one way or another, either to control the premises or to be able to modernize them. And by blocking them in their gentrification effort, we could extract some rent for the tenants, either a lot of money to relocate or a commitment to fixing up the apartment without raising the rent, by blocking the conversion of other units. So here is a practice connected up to a problem of how to theorize the practice in terms of the economic context of the neighborhood. So that's my first example. By the way, just one uh, I need to add to that, the category property, commodity, and contract were useless in this endeavor. So it was, it, it was immediately obvious that in so much as the commodity or property or contract were crucial categories of capitalist law, absolutely, but they had no bite because there were so many variants of capitalist law on the premises with so many overlapping legal regimes that if you thought you could reason from property either to know what was going to happen or what you should do, you just couldn't. So the basic idea was here a legal realist idea, the infinite diversity of legal regimes that are consistent with an abstract concept like property became very important. This is an introduction to the indeterminacy issue. So the basic idea was capitalism doesn't determine landlord-tenant law, except in the vaguest and most general way. If you want to be a lawyer, you have to understand that because that's how you invent things. You invent things based on the non-determinative character of the legal concepts that you're dealing with. So here's the second one. I spent all, I've spent quite a bit of time in the last 10 years working on Israel-Palestine legal issues in the US. Nothing like working on them here. Bears no resemblance to that whatever. Uh, there, that appealed to me in part because the situation of the Palestinians and the particular way in which the Israeli state had constructed the regime that oppressed them and oppresses them was something that was largely invisible to American liberal or progressive public opinion. So it was just a silenced dimension of a situation of very serious oppression. And it was very interesting to get involved in it, thinking I could use some of the same legal skills, capacities that had been involved in landlord-tenant. Other end of the spectrum on one level, from a poor neighborhood to a regime, an occupation regime, but also the internal legal regime in Israel-Palestine. Uh, so there the experience was, I'm just going to say, my triumphant moment was a year and a half ago, my colleague Alan Dershowitz, a very serious, deeply pro-Zionist, fanatical professor at Harvard, received an honorary degree at the University of Tel Aviv and used 10 minutes to denounce me personally for the evil betrayal of the principle of academic freedom and neutrality in my work. That's all I have to, uh, to offer. I mean, that's the single big accomplishment of this particular effort in the, in the American context. Uh, but I actually felt it really did make me feel good. So, so, the, so here I just want to make an analogous point, a quick analogous point. The equivalent of the problem of property for understanding landlord-tenant law is the concept of sovereignty for understanding Israel-Palestine legal issues. So there, the basic equivalent would be this. It's all very well to say there should be a sovereign state, a one state, or sovereign two states. But the category of sovereignty is itself so indeterminate. It's so much a matter of spectra alternative in different bundles of entitlements that you get nowhere by saying to yourself, that's not good because it's not sovereignty, or that's good because it is sovereignty. For example, you could characterize the current situation as a one-state solution for the occupied territories, because the level of, of actual formal juristic integration of the territories of the West Bank with Israel proper makes it plausible to say that there's been full annexation and there's a single sovereign. 
So if you want a one-state solution, you have to say more than a one-state solution. You have to say what kind of a one-state solution. And it will be on a spectrum with the current two-state solution, which is Gaza. So in Gaza, uh, in relation to Israel proper, there is a two-state solution. There is certainly nothing like full occupation, but it would be crazy to say that it's sovereignty. So whatever the solution is going to be, not one state, not two states understood as just guaranteeing sovereignty to anybody. It's got to be an infinitely more complicated rejiggling of the different bundles of entitlements that we think of as going into state power. And here, I'd say exactly the same thing. The indeterminacy of the category sovereignty is a source of power for people doing left analysis. Of course, anybody can use it once it's mastered. But good left strategies, according to me, has to start from some idea of the fundamental indeterminacy of what concepts that are often treated as plausible basis for doctrinal reasoning and for programmatic thinking. So that's, now, out of that practice, I got into courses. So I spent a lot of my time just as a teacher of not very popular courses on housing law and policy and not very pop popular courses on Israel-Palestine legal issues. This is a form of left practice in my own mind. Again, this is not a grandiose presentation. It's not that I actually filled, I, I never had in either course one tenth of the number, no, one 20% of the number of people in this room. So the largest possible draw in an open enrollment situation is between 20 and 30, 35 people. And I was very glad to get them out of a student body of 1,800. So we're not talking about taking the academic ramparts by storm, to put it mildly. But the idea was this practice was to produce an academic treatment in which the legal issues in landlord-tenant law and the legal issues in Israel-Palestine could be laid out in a relatively systematic way, incorporating the idea of the insights about the indeterminacy of the fundamental concepts that everybody wanted to use with very concrete historical, sociological, uh, exposition of the context, which would, I hoped, change students' minds. So this is a left practice that's attempted to convert students to a radical left understanding of the depths of oppression generated by the regime by the incredibly elaborate development of the regime as a legal regime in an historical context. That was part of another left practice. And again, this left practice was a complete failure on the political level, which was the attempt to have a serious radicalizing effect on my own faculty. So I'm just going along step by step here. This was critical legal studies at Harvard Law School. There was also critical legal studies nationally. I'm going to say a word about both. At Harvard Law School, here the idea of left practice means oppositionism. In the landlord-tenant context, it meant challenging the landlords. In Israel-Palestine, it meant challenging the Zionist narrative. In this context, it meant challenging our colleagues fairly directly on a series of issues that ranged from a general critique of the culture, because this is a 68-ish movement. The culture was authoritarian, relatively rigid, super straight, dead as a doornail in terms of sexiness and intensity. Uh, enormously cooled out, deeply consensus-based, based on the idea of a genuine social community where everybody had dinner parties, and I'm afraid we destroyed it, which many of our colleagues never forgave us for. They lived in a nice world, and we came along, all these you know, pseudo-hippie but not really uh, meritocrats like themselves, and we basically kept saying, no, 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 we don't want to play the game. It's really just not a nice game for us as colleagues. But then for the students, it was terrible. It was a form of induction into a kind of passivity in relationship to the system that was characterologically instilled. It was a very powerful socializing process. Then there was the critique of what was taught. So there just wasn't enough poverty law in the curriculum. There wasn't enough anything that actually fed left causes. So the idea was a specific one. The curriculum should have courses which will expose students to the possibility of a serious critique of the status quo. 
Um, and then there were appointments. So we had a million violent battles about who should be appointed. Those were the worst in normal academic uh, politics way. The most bitter ones were actually when people were denied tenure, and that began to happen. So we had basically about 10 years, we had a slow mounting of the left faction of the faculty, which expanded. But we weren't trying to seize state power at all. We just wanted sufficient influence so that they would have to bargain with us. So again, these are the, the micro tactics of the past of the legal left in American legal academic institutions. So the goal was, could we get to a point where the enough votes where we could veto an appointment and force them to deal with us to make an appointment? And about 19, I can remember the date, sometime in the middle of 1981, we vetoed an appointment and we got a deal six months later and one of us was appointed. This was, that, the goal was power in the institutional system for the left. We called ourselves the left faction. So there was no ambiguity about that. And we made it completely clear what our agenda was, that it was not to take control of anything. But we totally freaked them out. We genuinely freaked out our colleagues on a level that caused eventually a kind of spillover into the bar. And a significant part of the alumni began to campaign to get rid of us. They clearly felt we were devaluing the market value of their degrees because Harvard Law School was in the newspaper, and it no longer was a pure gold credential. Now it was associated with scandalous doings. And then a kind of combination, a right emerged, which was financed by uh, members of the bar, and they crushed us like bugs. So, I mean, these things happen. It was a great run while it lasted. They crushed us by denying tenure to left assistant professors. So that's how they did it. And that squelched the movement completely because the movement was dependent on the idea that you could let us recruit you and it was not a death sentence. So it became clear that association with us was dangerous. And that had a giant effect completely reasonably on about how everybody felt. Um, I got to see what time it is. Um, the national movement was an experience of what time did I start? Uh, about 13 minutes past. 13 minutes ago. Thank you no, so no, no, much. No, 13 minutes past. So you, you've had about 13 minutes. OK. Uh, that's good. So the, national, the thing about the national movement was it was um, deeply associated, and this was true at Harvard itself, it was associated everywhere with the arrival of women and people of color into legal academia, plus the shutting down of graduate schools in sociology, political science, and history that it had radical degree programs. So the, that was for the white men. So the white men who had a choice, go to law school or drive a cab in Cambridge, and many of them chose to go to law school rather than driving a cab, though not a small number of them actually did end up driving cabs. The, so the weird, unholy alliance was this. The number of law professors was expanding incredibly quickly. It just about doubled over a period of 15 years, and then it stopped growing after 1990, and critical legal studies came to an end about that time, too. Enormous new, this is the material base of a social movement. Jobs provided by the expansion of legal education means they have to hire a million people, and the standards begin to loosen, and affirmative action has become a part of the cultural norm for the liberal mainstream. So. They're hiring all these white men who wanted to be radical sociology professors, but no longer can even you know, get into graduate school, let alone get a job if they get their PhD. And lots of women and people of color are joining the faculties. So this was a great opportunity to make trouble, because the women often experience their first shock of the cultural life of the old, old boy guy club law faculties really made a lot of them mad in the mode of American feminism as it moved from the 70s into 80s. And they were totally serious. They were completely willing to be serious activists. The people of color were much more terrified, as well they might have been, and had much less easy cultural access to the milieu that they were entering. But they were also just stunned at the basic sort of racial blankness at best and implicit bias 
at worst, of the faculty that they joined. So we created a coalition. And the coalition eventually began to shatter when every, all these young people became more established and they got tenure, then the, the coalition of identity politics didn't fully outlast our success. But it lasted for a long time. And at the moment when uh, the repression came down, now I just have to say, I want to do a whine for a minute as a white male hegemon. A very large part of the oppression repression was aimed at us. Us white male guys were much easier to fire because it didn't raise any federal employment law issues, with one or two exceptions. <laughs> so um, uh, we, we really took it on the nose, but everybody was discouraged. So everybody was discouraged nationally. So that's an example. These are all examples of left activist ventures at different levels. Now I want to say a word about what you might call the theory battle. So this, what I've been describing so far, has been a very important part of my life, which is organizing and being organized. So I was organized in the landlord-tenant thing by Gary Bellow and Jean Charn, who were deep friends of mine, who became my deep allies, but I was their slave and their servant, which I wanted to be, because they were amazing strategists figuring out how to do this. In the Israel-Palestine context, it was actually, now it's, it was, all of the, the basic people were um, Yishai Blank, uh, Hany Syed, Amr Shalakani, Raef, a strike, and then Nimmer, uh, Roy Kreitner. So both um, Palestinians and Israeli Jews, Lema Abu Ode, I should mention, uh, a very significant group of people who influenced my politics as an activist at every point. And I don't think it's possible to do it without some network sense, without some sense of people you trust, people you like, people you'll go with, people who it seems worth taking minor risks, I tenure at Harvard Law School, minor risks for like that. So that was a very important part of it. But what about the theory? So the theory idea is the same. To me, left theory means theory, it's not I'm so right, why doesn't anyone recognize it? Or we've always been right, we're still right, about time someone recognized it. My idea of left theory is you guys are wrong and you have a lot of influence on these people who you're snookering. So in order to influence these people who you are influencing and try to get them on our side, it's time to attack you hard. So this is a different conception than the idea of left theory as a self-contained long genealogical tradition, which we develop internally, making it better over time. This is a much more combative idea of what left theoretical projects are. And they have critique in the strong sense, meaning not the critical tradition, but attacking the enemy. So the first enemy of this theoretical practice was moderate center-left American liberalism in legal education, which was very different from Britain. It was policy-based, um, and our basic argument was that our colleagues had a basically took for granted the legitimacy of a status quo whose legitimacy was vastly reinforced not by legal formalism, but by their middle-of-the-road, good judgment-based policy analysis. So we were attacking good judgment on the grounds that this is uh, classic attack on common sense that Costas and I share the history of Gramsci's attack on common sense. So the common sense, we were attacking the common sense, then it was neoliberalism. So first it was common sense, and then it was neoliberalism. So since Reagan's election about, by the way, Reagan once gave a speech to an American organization called the Federalist Society of Right-Wing Lawyers in which he denounced us. So this is equivalent of Alan Dershowitz's denunciation at Tel Aviv. Unbelievable thrill for us marginals. Ronald Reagan give you this speech and he said, and you have contributed to marginalizing and destroying critical legal studies, a great service that you have made to the American lawyers. It was like 30 seconds and we showed it like 100 times on a loop at a critical <laughs> legal studies conference. He was really good, I must say. He sounded as though he'd heard of it. <laughs> so, so the first target was common sense. The second target was neoliberalism. That involved, has involved, fairly concretely detailed attempts to answer, for example, classic neoliberal economic arguments, which justify 
neoliberal economic policies, both at the landlord-tenant level and at the level of uh, international development. So this is also another course devised with David Kennedy, who teaches here, which we created together called Law and Development. The course is basically a critique of mainstream development theory. That's what the course is. It's all about that. So mainstream development theory is presented in some detail. And to do well, you have to be able to critique it in some detail. You have to be able to say, <clears throat> how would you critique Amartya Sen? How would you critique Stiglitz? How would you create Ronnie, uh, uh, Danny Roderick? You have to have an actual set of arguments about what's wrong with them. So that's a very basic ideological activity, which is part of what I mean by left theory. Um, We're going to do well. How many minutes? We have another half hour. <laughs> I wouldn't take it from you. I would never dream of stealing from you no, the no, moments to come. Uh, so the, so now, now theory, theory, uh, uh, Matt's humiliating characterization of us as a continental, non-continental, we're not continental, we're non-continental, American legal realism in the late 19th century pragmatism. What a shameful theory, <laughs> theory suitcase to drag, roll, to, roll on that we drag behind us onto the plane to come to Europe to worship the genre. No. Uh, first of all, the choice. <laughs> both American pragmatism and American legalism are part of European legal thought and philosophy. So these guys, the pragmatists, are all studied Hegel in Germany when the British thought he was uh, at best a plumber. Uh, and their American pragmatism is a response to Hegelian social theory, actually. I hate the Hegelian philosophy. And American legal realism is directly an appropriation of some things that never really made it here, namely the lineage that goes from Rudolf von Nehring to Francois Genie, Raymond Salet, and René Dumont. So the Americans. But you spoke French. We didn't. That is the big thing. So we think that our theory tradition is infinitely more steeped in what was useful about continental critical thought than the British tradition ever was, not counting, however, what happened when the sun rose over Costas. <laughs> so, so we don't see it that way, in other words. And then during this time, we American Prince were just desperately theory whores. I mean, we were basically going for anything that was published in Europe. We were just scarfing it up. We had a Marx study group, you know, a Derrida study group, several Foucault study groups. So the thing that you, in your imagination is a confrontation, it's actually a confrontation of different ways of dealing with this continental philosophical tradition as it's brought to bear. And I think in both your case and in our case, here's our advantage. On the continent, there's almost nobody in law, in the whole legal universe, who has ever made any use of this stuff. So the fun part was, and what those guys themselves, the critical theorists, have to say about law is, you know, they've never been to law school. They've never tried a case. They don't know shit about law. So they very might be very into it as a kind of philosophical gesture. But it turns out that we could appropriate them for our legal purposes without having to worry about rivals in Europe who claim that they really know how to do it with law and without having to worry that they'd already said it all about law. So they neither, the greats, had neither said it all about law, nor did they have followers who had said it all about law using their apparat. So I would describe myself as, I mean, a shameful appropriator of European critical theory for legal purposes in a deliciously open space, where over there, there's nobody who is really going to trash us, because the big guys don't know about it, and the small guys are all getting l'agrégation or um, their you know, habilitation or whatever and don't have time for it. There are a few exceptions to that. So the, uh, let's see. Now, I'm going to close by an, an idea of how theory, how to distinguish in one way what I see as our typical theory line from the Britcrit line. But I know that what I actually read something you wrote about the Brit crits, which I basically think is right. I think you're gonna you're gonna be very disappointed, but maybe we'll try to insert a wedge here between us. 
We have a lobby today. I would say that the, that the American approach turned out to be usefully understood. There's an essay by Treves, an Italian sociologist of law, in which he makes a distinction between two different approaches to law by people who are theoretically inclined. The first approach is there, you have a theory or an orientation to social theory in which you recognize right away that law is a very important social institution and you incorporate law into your theory. So if you're a Marxist theoretician of society, you need to deal with law. If you're Derrida even, at some point decides he has to deal with law. So the theorist approaches law within the frame of their big frame, and they try to figure out how law fits or doesn't fit, and what original things you might say about law if you understood it as part of this general theory model. That's a very basic, very common approach in the theory world. The other approach is the obsession with the object. So people like me are obsessed with the object, law, legal discourse, legal practice, and its political impact, and the possibility of using it for a political purpose, and with the question of its relationship itself as the slave of politics. So this is my object, and in this approach, you eclectically use the theory tools that are available. So in my case, I totally love postmodernism. I love Marxism. I love them all. I love Foucault just as much as I love Derrida. I love Sartre more than any of them. Uh, and my basic idea is I love economics. I really like Ricardo. Ricardo, I give, I've been teaching Ricardo, and I lecture on Ricardo in relation to Marx in terms of the theory of surplus. So the basic idea here is use many, many, many things to draw a bead on the object. So it is, means abandoning the idea of being the author of the grand theory being the person who got law finally by placing it in the grand theory, but mastering enough of the critical vocabulary. So here would be a rough example. You might distinguish holistic social theory, Hegel, need Hegel because there is a totality, even if it's totally mysterious and who the hell knows what it is. Clearly, there's holes, which are very powerful. But then you also need paranoid structuralism. That is the idea that if there are holes, there are sinister things that you're not conscious of that are controlling everything you do without knowing it. And that would be a little Freud, the unconscious, a little Marx, the material base, a little McKinnon, the underlying sexual structure of society is also incredibly in that social theoretical tradition. Foucault, the early Foucault mentalité side is very like that. So that's also needed. We need this sort of luscious totality that realizes itself through history, but we also need the sense that our very subjectivity is a mere artifact. The subject is just an intersection on language, or blah, 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 something like that. So, but then also, another thing we need is the, um, if you like, the semiotic. That is, the idea that, as opposed to totalities, and as opposed to paranoid structuralist structures, the world is just a giant proliferation of sign systems within which we are speakers, and everything is speaking, speaking, speaking. It's the linguistic turn. is incredibly valuable and important. And then last of all, I would say we need the decisionist turn. That is, the turn that I would say is represented by Kierkegaard, by Nietzsche, by Carl Schmitt, by Sartre also, which basically says, all very well, but over and over and over again, that will run out and you're just going to have to decide what to do. There won't be a warrant. That's all very fine. The theory, whether it's human rights or new materialism uh, or uh, whatever, or postmodernism, is going to run out. And then at this level, it's important to contemplate, look into the horror of the situation, and say, either I'm going to kill the kid because God told me to, or I'm not. So that's the endless theme. Now I want to say one word about Costas. Uh, so when people say we are enemies, we have to be enemies, it is required that critical, so, and look, so he was trying to, he just wanted to gin it up. He has a desire that that should be true. So I'm, I first met Costas, it turns out in 19, what did we decide, 84. 84. So in 1984. 
I would say that we had an unbelievable conversation that bears a strong relationship to the things we've been talk I've been talking about in this talk. It was very, very much in the context of Costas. Alan Hunt was running a poly, a left-wing poly. Costas was, you were very junior. You were really at the bottom of the pile. And a million of the questions raised were about activism, both outside law faculties and inside law faculties. What is it to attack? What is an ideological assault on the other side as opposed to just being a theorist here by myself who other left theorists will admire? So every one of those seems was present. Um, and although we don't know each other very well, I've always actually seen you, as I think you see me, as someone who is basically a comrade. And I'm delighted to have you here. It Thank makes you. me feel very good and warm that you're here. Brilliant. How can you follow that? I mean, listening to some of these American academics, you feel overawed. And perhaps you may have heard that one of the most legendary events in uh, the history of American crits is the 3R lecture that Robert, Robert Unger gave, and now, of course, goes by the name Critical Legal Studies. And I was not there, but everyone told me how brilliant it was, you know, coming in sentences, paragraphs, you know, sort of pages. It was like seeing it, you know, on uh, the PowerPoint, they didn't have PowerPoint. And then Duncan tells me the guy was rehearsing it for three days <laughs> in a room full of mirrors and he was talking to himself. And that's how he delivered such a brilliant talk. And this is not something that Duncan does. I mean, Duncan <laughs> is a natural. Duncan does it without a need to rehearse. And I think what Duncan uh, did today, what you gave us again today is a gift, another gift, because for me, uh, Duncan's nickname is Duncan the Gift. <laughs> now, another master of mine, uh, Jacques Derrida, has told us that when you receive a gift, in order to keep the gift in its sovereignty, in its absolute nature, you never give a counter gift. You don't introduce the gift into an economy of exchange, of offer and acceptance, of equivalence, and, uh, and reciprocity. Because then you undermine the nature of the gift. The gift works, the gift performs, if and when, at a later point, the recipient of the gift acts, gestures in ways that are informed by the original gift. And in this way, through the performance, through the repetition in a different context, you mentioned Kierkegaard in that uh, respect, of course, both time is created and communities emerge. And in that sense, I would say that uh, with Duncan, we had over the last 30 years a, an intimate but non-operative community. Mm -hmm. Intimate, but not operative, because we met a few times. But for me, he gave me gifts. So I'll mention two or three gifts that he gave me and were absolutely central in my development and thinking. The first is precisely going back to 1983, when I got my first job as a young lecturer, well, not that young, but anyway, as a new lecturer at uh, Middlesex Poly. My head of school said, uh, Costas, you write things which are incomprehensible to the lawyer, even to him, the great Alan Hunt. <laughs> Secondly, you have radical politics. And third, a strong accent. <laughs> you are not going to go far. <laughs> I think that I still tick all three of these, <laughs> all, 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 all three of these boxes. And then the following year, 1984, it was a hard workshop. It was the first time I met Duncan and listened to Duncan, but I also met, I think, Hugh Collins for the first time and Nikki Les. Is Nikki here? No, I, I don't see her. And then after the brilliant talk he gave at uh, UCL, I think it was, or the Institute, I'm not sure now, we went to a restaurant, to an Indian restaurant, and we discussed Sartre and Gramsci and legal theory and how you do it in an institution. And then we sang Italian partisan songs. <laughs> Avanti popolo alla discorsa, <laughs> and o bella ciao, and so on. And then, you know, I thought to myself, okay, 
perhaps I do have a chance. If Duncan Kennedy can do these things, even with my strong accent, I mean, he takes the other two uh, boxes, <laughs> critical theory, difficult theory, and radical politics, not a strong accent, although it is strong here in Europe. Uh, so we can still do it. The second uh, event happened uh, about 10 years later, in uh, 1993, after a bunch of us set up the Backpack uh, Law School. And I remember that in the first year, a couple of our students, mature students, were recording everything we said, including personal tutorials. They would turn up in a personal tutorial with a little tape recorder in those days and record everything we were saying. And then we learned that the Association of Conservative Lawyers wrote to the uh, Law Society and told the Law Society that they should not give us accreditation. We didn't have uh, an accredited degree as yet. And of course, without accreditation, you cannot have a law degree. At that point, I confronted one of those two students and I said, are you spying on us? Uh, because the, the letter which was sent to the college and we saw it had detailed references both to our writings and also uh, some uh, quotes from lectures. So I said, you know, are you spying on us? You know, well, what, what, what are we trying to do? I mean, if we don't get accreditation, you know, the year and a half you spent here would be a total waste of time. <laughs> and the woman said, no, 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 we're not spying on you, but you must know that there is a huge campaign to stop you guys from becoming the Harvard of Britain and imitating Duncan Kennedy. <laughs> now, the idea that Bergman would become the Harvard of Europe was totally ridiculous, so we just <laughs> forgot about that. It goes back to what uh, uh, stories Duncan was saying earlier. But the idea of imitating Duncan Kennedy, again, I felt it was a little gift that I was receiving from the guy, because by then I knew his work, I was teasing his work, I really loved what he was doing, and so on. So I thought to myself, you know, that's a good thing to be imitating, if you possibly can. And on this one, I should also say that over my long career in the university, I have perhaps met very many, perhaps most major intellectuals in the world. Right now, Slavoj Žižek is giving a lecture at my institute next door at Birkbeck, and I'm here, because I prefer to be with Duncan, not with Slavoj. <laughs> and I don't know if you've met, ever experienced that, but when you meet people that you read, you usually get very disappointed. <laughs> there is a mismatch between the writings and the person. And Duncan, a couple of other people, is a huge expression, exception, sorry, to that. His <laughs> behavior, his comportment, his writings match each other almost perfectly. Words and deeds, words and songs go brilliantly together. And that is another gift. But the final gift, of course, is precisely the gift of critical legal studies. A persistent and continuous gift, because it was precisely when these guys opened the space, created the name, created a certain aura that the space for us here to uh, start a movement and a school of thought and a way of looking at the world uh, uh, really took off. And indeed, it was in 1985, a year after we met Duncan, that we had the first conference at Kent. Joanne was there, and I think Hugh was there, and perhaps a few other people in the audience. The first conference, critical legal conference. And of course, the conference is still going on every year. In the first weekend in September, we're now in the 20, close to 30th conference. It is happening still. And this is another question. Why we did not collapse in the way uh, the Americans did? I was at the last. American conference, I think it was 1994 at uh, Georgetown. Yeah, and there was an amazing incident for us, the Brit Crits who were there, you know, sort of to, uh, in a sense, uh, take in the, the, the great spirit of our American colleagues, that uh, in, in a session <coughs> in which I think Mark Tasnet was there and some of the uh, incoming younger people, people of color and women and so on, ended in uproar and Tasnet left the the stage saying that you know he has no longer a place in this conference and then Duncan gave the 
the final talk. He was chaired by Kim Cranshaw, so therefore you know, he was playing to both constituencies and did very well, I remember. So that, that, that is you know, sort of the beginning for us. You know, they had created that kind of space that we could, in a sense, upstarts, as not particularly well known, neither Mrs. Thatcher uh, nor, I don't know, Lord Lester ever <laughs> mentioned us as, as uh, great threats or great, uh, or, 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 or great uh, hopes for legal education. But then an abiding experience for a young person who came from Greece in 1974 after the dictatorship and so on, and did my doctorate here and then started my, my uh, work, was this. The total lack, absence, of critical, of uh, legal scholarship and legal research from the rest of the academy. The only reason in 1983 when I started my career that a philosopher or a person in English or in uh, art, theory or history, whatever, would go to law is if they were getting the divorce. <laughs> but then if you look at the history of Western civilization, from the Bible to Plato and Aristotle, all the way to Kant, Hegel, Marx, but even the contemporaries, uh, Luhmann and Derrida and Habermas and so on, when thinking turned to the way in which body attaches to soul and society institutions get reproduced, of course they went to law, they knew law, and Duncan mentioned it, or they read legal stuff in order to understand the principle of reproduction of society. So what had happened? Law and legal study and legal scholarship used to be central, a central part of our Western civilization, and then had become totally peripheral. And legal uh, pedagogy was parochial and vocational and had nothing to do with any why the field? And uh, this is, in a sense, the gift that we owe on a more continuous, persistent basis to Duncan and his, uh, his comrades, that they opened up that space that then, of course, we came also to occupy. And we tried to occupy it precisely by trying to push back again both scholarship and pedagogy towards where it belongs, which is the heart of the academy and the heart of our culture. And I'm really proud to say today that there is no major conference in philosophy, in history, in art theory, uh, or in visual studies that will not have also a lawyer or a law academic speaking about these matters. We have, I think, helped reintroduce legal scholarship and legal research into the heart of the academy. Now, what did we have to do that? And this is not about me. This is about a bunch of people, many of them in this very room. We faced in legal theory, and I'm speaking now just about legal theory, a monolithic construct with its own different, of course, versions and tendencies and factions and so on, which was based on two, on one question and one claim. The question was, for legal theory, when we started, what is law? It was an attempt, an essentialist attempt, to find what is the essence of law. And once that essence was declared or pronounced, then a process of purification, the pure theory of law, a good example of that, of cleansing, whatever is not law, leave it out. And you know, we concentrate into what law is, these are the characteristics of law, and then we seek them out in different phenomena, and then those that have the characteristics, then they're law. And the second, uh, the claim was that irrespective of what are the characteristics of law, whether it is rules or principles or norms, whether it was a positivistic or a normative or interpretive jurisprudence, the law is a system. It is internally coherent. It follows either a certain derivation of norms from a central norm or a central rule, or it is organized as a set of uh, principles 
the integrity or the fairness or equal respect and concern, and these principles put the whole thing together. And when we start now looking at this and taking our cue and I think our inspiration very much from the Americans, the first thing we do is to attack the indeterminacy thesis, you remember that uh, Duncan mentioned, to attack that idea of order. In other words, to take now the law of text and bring it to the texts of law, to use an array of methods and theories from semiotics, from literary theory, from hermeneutics, from psychoanalysis, to see how the legal text operates. Because our main principle was that if there is sexism, there is racism, there is class exploitation and oppression in society, that should also appear on the body of the text. That through the organization of the text, you can find the symptoms or the wounds of that underlying trauma. So that was the first period. I would call it an aesthetic period, a period in which those more um, literary uh, terms and methods were used. Then in the 90s, we had a second period, a period of ethics or ethicization. Because of course, after 1989, you got the turn to ethics, humanitarianism, human rights, the end of history, the world has come together, international law had its big day, still does. Because since we now have a united world, whether as a cosmopolitan or an imperial world, clearly the question of rights, the question of entitlements applies in the same way all over the place. And faced with that, and of course with a certain defeat that was felt, the defeat was, was the collapse of communism. And of course the collapse of communism hurt more people like us who were totally anti-Stalinist, who were not, I was not allowed to go to the, uh, the Eastern Europe countries because I couldn't get a visa, because I was well known as someone who was critical. But we, of course, got also the defeat and the failure of the Berlin Wall, you know? The bricks of the Berlin Wall hit us on the head more than the Stalinists, who very easily uh, transubstantiated themselves all over Eastern Europe and became the new oligarchs and so on. So we wanted to, ethics, the idea of an ethics became contested. We needed to find ways through which we could have a discussion with our liberal colleagues on human rights and the rest of it, but in attacking that kind of approach. And of course, there we discovered ideas of otherness, of radical otherness coming out of the Jewish tradition, coming out of, uh, uh, you know, from Levinas and Buber to Derrida, the idea that there is a justice which is immanent to the law. And when the law does not come up with that, those fair and just answers that itself proclaims to promote, then of course you attack it, but there of course you are in, uh, in alliance with many Liberal, but there is also a second justice, a justice which is transcendent, which is outside the legal system, to which the whole of law, the whole of the legal edifice has to give an account. And pretty soon that, I think, came to an end. We moved from the period of the end of history, the period of the New World Order. If the New World Order that uh, President Bush announced in 1989 existed, it was the shortest in history <laughs> because it came to an end in the late 2000s, and of course now with a huge crisis, particularly in Europe, in Southern Europe and so on, we are in a new field. We have entered an age of resistance. This age of resistance has its landmarks. You can call them uh, formally from the Arab Spring all the way to the Indignados, to Greece, then to Occupy, then Turkey, Brazil. We know that people will get out again in the streets. We don't know when, but we know that that kind of facile uh, sense of peace and reconciliation is no longer on, on the go. And this is where now we as lawyers find ourselves in a third phase. And of course, these phases are all very artificial. They overlap and so on. I'm not saying that there is a strict periodization in which necessarily you're asked to take a more political stance, some more than others, uh, particularly here in Europe, particularly in the south of Europe, uh, and so on. But it le this idea that now we have to take a political stance or a more obvious political stance in relation to our ethical concerns and aesthetic practices, I think, you know, sort of is, can be helped very much by 
what is happening to the law. And uh, Duncan has extensively written about the way in which in a neoliberal biopolitical, I would uh, suggest, uh, uh, legal system that we now have, the rule of law tradition that we all loved, even if we criticized it, is, in a sense, on the way out. The form of law has become detailed. The sources have become multiple. The aims are clear and contradictory. The effects unpredictable. The great claim of law and the rule of law in modernity was that there is a distance, albeit imperceptible, between law and the order of the world. That there is a distance between the is and the ought. And to that extent, law, like socialism or religion or nationalism, was there to correct society. And that is the distance. That is the role of the distance between these and the odd. You may disagree with the particular policies that the legal odd was pursuing in different stages, different countries, and so on, but there was a distance. And that distance has now collapsed in a huge law society amalgam that has validity, that has power, but has very little value and significance anymore. And this is where, the, uh, for the critical lawyer, particularly at the political stage, the answer to, the, 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 the attempt to find positions after utopia has atrophied, and imminent critique has been co-opted, is a very major issue, but something that I think younger colleagues and younger friends and comrades have taken on and in a series of blogs and so on promote this idea of a new politics of law. But I want to finish with a reference to a superb piece of critical scholarship with radical intent that Duncan just published in the journal Law and Critique and you can find it online uh, in a library close to you or in, on your laptop. The piece is called The Hermeneutics of Suspicion in American Legal Thought. Duncan says that elite jurists try to uncover hidden ideological motives behind what they consider the wrong legal argument of their opponents, while claiming, of course, that their own answers are innocent of ideology, are true, right, correct, and innocent of ideology. This suspicious hermeneut, as Duncan calls these characters, uh, believes that legal reasoning is sufficiently determinate so as to allow him to identify mistakes in others, but also to give him the right answer. Now, of course, I think all of us here have been there. Writing a piece of doctrinal analysis, we place ourselves in the position of a super Supreme Court, of a super House of Lords or Constitutional Court who can iron out the inconsistencies and reach the correct or the politically effective or the aesthetically pleasing answer. But in a brilliant move, Duncan argues that the main influence of ideology is on the direction of legal work and not on legal error. That it is ideology that makes you write what you write and argue what you argue rather than leading you to error. And this is where you have to, uh, to focus. Indeed, it is not particularly hard to show that a text, any text, the Bible, Shakespeare, or the latest decision of a court is full of contradictions and inconsistencies. It is much harder to work out what practices, procedures, and ruses make texts appear coherent and authoritative. And making the next brilliant move from text to context, Duncan argues that the rise of this hermeneutics of suspicion follows transformations in the relationship between law and politics and in that between elite jurists and, on the other hand, political, economic, and social elites. This is the hermeneutics of suspicion. Of suspicion. Now, of course, as you know, the concept of the hermeneutics of, uh, of suspicion which was used by Ricoeur, but has been taken by, up by a number of people, it refers to what Louis Althusser called the three great continents of thought, which is Hegel, Marx, and the dialectics of struggle, Nietzsche, Foucault, and the disjunctive synthesis between will and power, and finally, of course, Freud and the post-Freudian tradition. 
And I think it is, for me, the greatest, in a sense, praise and admiration I can give to uh, Duncan in saying that both in that piece, but also throughout his work, he has used all three positions from a hermeneutics of suspicion. In the way in which, through the rewriting of the idea of uh, indeterminacy and the fundamental cont contradiction, move towards a post-Marxist theory of ideology. Ideology no longer as something which is superstructural and can be get rid of, but as something that opens to us the world. And therefore, our business and our duty, political duty, is not, as Marx said in the famous 11th thesis to Feuerbach, to change the world. It is to reinterpret the world in order to change it. That ideology is our opening to the world. And similarly, of course, in terms of his uh, discussion of Foucaultian uh, politics and so on, and of course in that piece, he claims that those kind of, sort of rather silly hermeneutics of, uh, of uh, suspicion get involved, and he uses the psychoanalytical term, of a projective identification. In other words, they project to their enemies the basic split, they displace typical Freudian position, they displace into their opponents what they fear in themselves. They have the inner conflict, and then in order to defend their psychic economy, they put it onto you. And I can finish by saying that although Duncan sees this idea of projective identification as something problematic, many of us have projectively identified with you, <laughs> Duncan. And in a sense, I think that piece, but all the work shows that uh, Duncan is one of the last great European intellectuals. Those people who, as it were, are descendants of what we call the radical enlightenment, but also of that erudition that goes with, say, Central European Jewry, a, 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 a kind of uh, a, a tradition that is now on the way out, and Duncan is, uh, is one of the great, I think, representatives of that tradition. So, and against the Derrida, I will finish saying thank you, Duncan. I'm a, bit dis very I'm a bit disappointed <laughs> at this stage. Um, we've got about a uh, quarter of an hour, 20 minutes for questions. So perhaps we can see has got a microphone. So perhaps we can just open it out. Silence, no hands. You're celebrating the memo. Ah, Lynn. Hello, Lynn Welshman from SOAS. Uh, very quick, thank you both, obviously. I, I won't say that anymore. Um, I teach a human rights clinic here at SOAS, and I was wondering, um, there's been a very interesting piece by Bethnica Lopez et al, about six human rights clinicians and poverty lawyer workers now, 2011, I don't know if you've seen it, and it's about the impact of critical legal studies on the pedagogy and practice of uh, it grew from a discussion between poverty, poverty clinic lawyers and human rights cl clinic lawyers in the States and makes a lot of drawing on exactly the points you were talking about, how you take um, the lessons of critical legal scholarship, which has been critical of clinics now, apparently human rights clinics, very interesting, and how you teach that to the students, not just in terms of client-clinic relationship, but more broadly in terms of immersion or understanding and uh, understanding of the issues you were talking about, economic and social rights in particular in the States, we're looking at human rights as a US issue, not international issue only. But actually, my question is, you said, because you haven't seen the article. <laughs> but I was wondering... Well, I can, of course, answer it anyway. <laughs> yes, I would, if you would, because of your, comp because of your introduction about the, uh, the, the work you were doing on landlord-tenant stuff earlier than the critiques that are being made now. So, so I, I, because I haven't read the article, I'm not going to answer it. But it, it does seem worth mentioning that um, in... The critical legal studies as an actual academic movement was a heterogeneous mixture. And one of the most interesting aspects of it was the 
back-and-forth tension between people you might describe as roughly post-Marxist, uh, not anti-Marxist, but post-Marxist, the human rights-oriented people, the identity-oriented people, not exactly the same, though related, and the people in the tendency that I more or less represent, which Costas was describing. So the the um, the in the U.S. there has been, I think, a very constructive, though there's less of it now than there used to be, uh, back and forth, which was partly between people actively doing serious social justice activism, either say oriented to class issues or where therefore to say tenant rent strikes, or oriented to a human rights idea as a very powerful overarching belief of theirs that those were the abstractions, we would say, that really do orient work in a fairly concrete way. And then um, the identity political dimension of it had to do with the extent to which there are identities that very powerfully determine or orient conduct and aspirations if you are, say, in our case, the very important issue was African-American identity, and the other one was female identity. So critical legal studies has been a site for arguments back and forth in which within the movement there were, and now everybody's spun out, but the relationships among the people still exist, to what extent should one understand, say, human rights or capital or identity as in some way both really explaining and really orienting change and to what extent that doesn't work because over and over again the explanation is too weak and the question of what to do ends up in this decisionist moment in which you have to make a leap of some type. So this article is doubtless part of the continuing discussion which has been very valuable I think for everybody. Uh, Virginia Mantovello, UCL. Um, I, I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I wanted to ask uh, uh, Professor Kennedy, you drew a distinction at some point, which I didn't catch exactly, between your approach to the law, which views it as an object, you said, and a Marxist approach to the law. Can you explain this a little bit more? I, I meant to make a general contrast between the idea that your general approach, which could be Marxism, human rights, Weberian sociology, it could be uh, uh, literary critical or linguistic. So you have a general approach, and law is one of the things that you incorporate into your overall presentation and synthesis. So there would be, and I, I completely agree with Costas, that in the tradition of political philosophy, law has been a very important part of your political philosophy, whatever it is. It might not be when you start out, but after a while, uh, you got to have law in there or the political philosophy looked at as a whole is not going to be experienced as conveying one of the central sites of discourse about society. And Costas was lamenting the disappearance of this, and I lament it too. But the point about this is slightly different. Here the idea is another approach, which Treves describes the other approach, is obsession with the object. So the object is law, some set of aspects of law that are the object of interest. And you say, uh, that's what I'm interested in. I want to use whatever I can find. So I'm going to be a scavenger. I'm going to try to learn as much as I can about as many of the optics as possible. And that's the classic idea of triangulating law, of getting it through the multiplication of perspectives. So objectivity is only the multiplication of perspectives. You are objective to the point of where you can understand it economically, phenomenologically, culturally, psychoanalytically. The more you have, the more, the more contradictory ways to produce different images, the closer you are to the truth in heavy quotation marks. So the, here the idea is two different approaches to Marxism and law. One approach is 
what is the Marxist theory of law, or how could I, as a Marxist, develop a Marxist theory of law as a contribution to the general development of Marxist social theory? Whereas my attitude is, how can I appropriate or scavenge, or in pretentious Levi-Strauss talk, do bricolage with, say, class as a concept, say, uh, the concept of ideology, say, the concept of um, uh, revolution as ways to combine with, say, the psychoanalytic or the Nietzschean or whatever as to approach law. So the question, the difference is between a eclectic methodological pluralism that nonetheless is committed to relatively high levels of specific precision within each of the elements. You have to be a good Marxist to do this. You just have to be, at the same time, good at, say, semiotics versus the aspiration to make Marxism the science of society. Thank you. Um, Alfredo Santafilo from SOAS. But thanks very much for both presentations. They were absolutely uh, wonderful. Um, I would like to have a bit of a background of the kind of long-term trajectory of the legal left, not being a lawyer myself. Um, I think some of the tribulations that uh, both of you uh, described were common across the social sciences with the ascendance of neoliberalism, the retreat of the left more broadly, and, and so on. Do you see changes happening more recently? And, and I think the, the, the very fact that you have this tremendous audience here today shows not only the influence of your own work, but also, but also the fact that SOAS is a special place and that lots of young scholars in the, across the social sciences concerned with inequities and injustice in, in the world out there and, and, and what can we do about this. Do you see changes within your own discipline and do you see any elements of weakness in the mainstream and of the rise of an alternative that kind of resonates with your own work uh, over time? Uh, I wish you hadn't asked me that question. Because, uh, but this is typical. So I was having a conversation with a colleague who was maybe 10 years younger than me this morning. And she began a sentence by saying, one of the things about young people today is. He's 20 years younger than you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, I basically feel the sentence, I, I, this sentence uh, comes trippingly off my tongue. The thing about young people today in my milieu of the legal academy is that there was an unmistakable, very deep cultural shift to the, to the center from the left and to the right from the center. Not a flip from the left to the right, but from the left to the center and from the center to the right. And it's way beyond politics. It's even beyond a category like neoliberalism doesn't fully account for it. There is a sense of the appeasing of the passions of the 70s, 80s, and 90s, it's as though some of it is post-traumatic. So it, in some of the legal academy, a young professor will say, above all, we must not reproduce the Lebanese civil wars of legal academy in the 80s. Of course, they were seven, even more than 20 years, they were seven when those wars were happening, but they still have now internalized from their older colleagues the idea that <coughs> serious left contestation is unbelievably toxic and dangerous. And that has to do also with, so. but now, is that completely unrelated to deeper generational change? So of my students, my students today are the product of a series of socio-cultural 60s events that are not about burning bras or rioting in the street. They're also the product of the divorce wave in the United States. In the United States, everybody in the upper third of the income distribution, everyone got divorced between 1975 and 1985. It's an actual verified thing. Every single person who was married got divorced. I, I didn't get divorced. But everybody else got divorced except me and my wife. So, 
And what that produced was something that is just visibly present in the culture today, the culture of middle and upper middle class children, is an enormous number of them grew up with a single parent. And for an enormous number of them, their parents' divorce is an incredibly central thing. Very like the battle at Harvard Law School in 1985 is what happened to their families. That age cohort today gets married when they're 30, they have their first child when they're 31, and the divorce rate for this socioeconomic stratum is now the lowest it has been since 1900. So I know this sounds really bizarre, right? I mean, the cultural change is profound. And I don't myself easily glom on to one of the reasons why I'm going to retire at the end of next year is that I don't easily find anymore in the room that responsive element of longing for something a little explosive that I think has to be, for my idea of the left, has to be there. So I don't have a lot of hope for the, the young people today. Uh, on the other hand, nobody my age ever has more than hypocritical expression of hope for young people today. OK, can I come in on this? <laughs> <laughs> now we can disagree. <laughs> now, of course, in, in a sense, I have to agree with Duncan when he talks about the United States. I have no idea what's happening in the United States. And resistances of all types are located, are situated in particular societies, histories, uh, traditions, and so on. And he may be right. Uh, in what he's saying. But again, I would not necessarily put the greatest emphasis on generational issues, but on ways in which capitalism has changed over the last 20 or 30 years, starting with Mr. Reagan and Mrs. Thatcher here, and of course, uh, culminating, you know, sort of in what we're seeing uh, uh, nowadays in Europe with austerity and so on. And one of the key aspects of that, what we call neoliberal, for lack of a better word, uh, uh, period, is the fact that we are asked to turn our own selves into little businesses. And that we ask to create markets about every kind of activity that you know, we took for granted, particularly in a kind of post-war social democratic contract you know, here in Europe. And of course, that has a very important ideological effect, the way in which people see themselves in relation, say, to health, to education, uh, but also in terms of consumption and, you know, that endless and nihilistic uh, desire to consume. But then resistances have happened, and uh, I claim, perhaps a little uh, optimistically, uh, that we have now entered uh, an age of resistance, that there was a long hiatus from 68 or 70 and so on, and I think 2010-11, a, a long hiatus in which that kind of political, uh, of economic and political arrangement, in a sense, you know, changed the world quite a lot. But now we have entered, I think, a new period. I mean, both in terms of legal initiatives, but certainly in terms of political initiatives, we see now that people are taken to the streets. Uh, you know, we, we saw it in this country repeatedly. Soas has been, of course, one of the main places where students <coughs> and indeed uh, staff resistance, you know, has been happening. Well, let me also say something perhaps of little importance to many of you, but I think eventually of huge importance. Uh, this Sunday we have the European elections all over Europe. Today in Britain, because Britain, as you know, votes on Thursdays, in the, the, the next uh, 26 countries vote on Sunday. In my country of birth, Greece, if the radical left party wins these elections, it is likely to be the first ever elected radical left government in Europe within the next six months. If that happens, if people see all over Europe that a small place like Greece, which of course was picked as a guinea pig of that austerity uh, experiment that we saw, and of course you know, is going through a huge humanitarian crisis, stood up and reversed policies and governments and elites of 40, if not of 200 years, then it seems to me that people in Italy, in Spain, in Portugal will start thinking the same. So we do have openings, and of course they differ from place to place. It is, I think, what we have to resist is that kind of left melancholy 
That left melancholy, and I'm not, I'm not saying that Dante has it, but you know, you see it everywhere amongst the left. That idea, and I'm using here a term from Walter Benjamin, where you have become so obsessed with your love object, and indeed with the failure <laughs> of your love object, that you have totally internalized that defeat, and you are happier to be wallowing in despair and melancholy and so on, rather than getting out in the street, whatever, whether it is in a micro-political sense or in the more macro-political sense that I was talking about earlier, and trying to do things. I think also we have entered a, a new period uh, all over the world, and certainly here in Europe. Thank you. Do I, you want to I, say I completely agree with everything that Gustav said. The question was about young academics, say, in my universe in the United States. But I actually completely agree with that. Do you have desire to win? Do I have a desire to win? <laughs> yes, actually, a very strong desire to win. I don't, I, I don't identify with state power very much. So when I think of the desire to win, I don't think of, uh, I'm, I'm not Napoleonic. So I don't have that sense of what it is to win. But I'll give you actually an example of the pleasure of winning. It gives me incredible pleasure that in the United States, the uh, governing elites, the ruling class, is losing its confidence in the Israeli government. And I've participated in a small way for a while in the process of winning. It's actually an experience of winning. It's intoxicating. It's wonderful. It's not Napoleonic, but actually you're doing something in a relatively consistent way, and time passes, and it's different at the end. I love that. And I think that's totally possible at the level that Costas is talking about. And I don't equate American legal academia with legal academia anywhere else. I mean, where I was talking about America, in France, for example, or in Italy, I just spent you know, two days participating in a little leftist master's program. With which, Negri. That was in September. Ah, that was September. <laughs> I was on the platform with Tony Negri. Nobody could understand a word he said. Sorry. It was completely incomprehensible. It was a student audience. There were maybe 150 Italian students. They came in. The room was packed. They came in totally, totally bright-eyed, just their whole body language of intense attention. But it was very complicated theory of the multitude replacing the class and the, the in the comments. And at some point, they started texting. There was this sort of weird thing. You would see a wave. Are they texting each other, their mothers, their girlfriends? Um, but so I love that, though. So that's, I'm totally, I adore that kind of thing. And I think there's more, uh, I actually, <laughs> I'm much more oriented. Yeah, that sounds like the event, more like winning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do think, though, that, that um, Actually, uh, you've, you've challenged me, right. I, I don't, I agree with you that that depressed thing is bad. Um, I agree that the way I put it, because it's really about legal academia in the United States, I do think that it's a fairly uh, fair representation of legal academia in the United States. Once a site of incredibly interesting stuff, and now not. But, but, I, I have a very strong feeling that resistance that it is an age where new forms of resistance are coming into existence. And actually, I see my role in part, if you know, no longer in a site that's dramatically central to exciting resistance practices, but the whole idea was to develop left analysis that would be useful not to lawyers, but to potential clients. So let me make that distinction. The idea wasn't that lawyers were to actually be the people in charge. The idea was that left analysis, whether in the law and development domain, landlord-tenant, or whatever, would be available, that there would be a larger and larger archive of academic work that, say, Syriza comes to power, somebody's gonna, they're going to have a gigantic set of debates about law and development basically, in which every extant theory will be on the table. And so, you know, we made our students read Scott Newton. Maybe someone in Theresa will actually read about Uzbekistan or something like that in 1925. That could actually happen. Um, and that's very hopeful. And I also have hope for the return of the children, so of these. So if I'm still alive, here's my image. 
there will be a rise of left legal academia. There'll be millions of American radical left students. They will be having an enormous rally. And at the beginning of the rally from the wings, I will be in a wheelchair. And I'll be wheeled out onto the stage and turned to face the audience as a kind of backdrop as the proceedings unfold. That would be great. That would be winning. Unfortunately, that's, um, I think we're at the end of our time, a lot of time. I think we'd love to. Would you like to hear comment? More from you. <laughs> <laughs> um, the prospect of wheeling you out like Jeremy Bentham sounds quite <laughs> fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I just thank both of our panelists? I think, I think it's been, been wonderful. I think um, it's a fabulous way to start this afternoon. Thank you.